We're in San Diego, California to speak with a decorated Navy SEAL, a veteran of the Vietnam War, an artist, and a triathlete. He's also a watch collector with an eye for vintage military issue dive watches. His name is Philip Moki Martin, and today we're talking watches. Well, Moki, thank you so much for having us into your home and sharing some of your watches with us. It's a real treat to be here. My pleasure. It's my pleasure, absolutely. And you have, uh, you have a very long-standing history with water, with the ocean, and I think that speaks eventually to something about watches, but certainly to a lot of what you've done with your life. You grew up in Maui, correct? Yes. And where did you first find your love for the water? Was it in swimming or? It was in swimming, uh, body surfing, you know, at eight or nine years old. And my love grew from that. At about 12, I started spearfishing. I got really good at that, okay. chasing things and having things chase me. And I grew up near the beach where they were training frogmen to go to the Pacific War in 1944. So that had quite a bit of an impact on me. And from then on, I think at age 11 or 12, and of course Hollywood helped with a couple of Frogman movies mm -hmm. in the 50s, I knew exactly what I wanted to do in life. And then what was your transition into the Navy? I graduated from high school and all I saw was pineapple fields and I thought, oh, no way. So. A friend and I joined the Navy, and we were going to go in as a buddy program. And as soon as we got out of boot camp, he went to the East Coast, and I went to Great Lakes. And I said, oh, I came in the Navy to be a frogman. What happened to that? Oh, well, you got to have a job. you got to have a, you know, a, a rating and everything. And I thought, oh, my God. So it took me about three years to finally get my orders to then UDT train in, in, here in Coronado. When I graduated in 1965, I was so proud to receive the big watch. I watched all the frogmen and seals, and they all had the big tutors. Right. So I waited until I graduated, and the first day you graduate, you get issued your, it's called war bag, and all your clothes and everything. And then you get your watch, you okay. get your tutor. There was one man that worked in supply. When you go up there, he says, all right, here's your swim fins, here's your face mask, here's your clothes, here's your boots, and here's your watch. The watch came in a box. Okay. The first one I got it was in a box, this one. The first thing he said was, make sure you take that bracelet off and put the nylon strap on, because if you lose one pin, the other pin will hold the watch to you. So I did that. And that's this, the that's uh, it. 7928. What yes. year would that have been? Uh, 1965. For those who maybe don't know much about diving or what diving would have been then versus now, this would have been a tool to keep you alive not only to coordinate yes. with other groups around right. you via radio and such, but, but you would have actually been using this to manage dive times and things like that, time yes. in the water. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're basically shallow water divers. Mm -hmm. You know, we're combat swimmers. So rarely did we go below 60 feet, even though our qualifications is up to 120 feet. We're horizontal divers. You swim along 20 feet, 30 feet below the surface of the water to make a ship attack, or you're swimming in on a hydrographic reconnaissance of a beach you're not diving for a deep. So I made a couple of deployments with the UDT platoons, and then uh, SEAL Team 1 took a devastating hit where three guys got killed. Three of my teammates were killed, and 17 others were wounded. And uh, SEAL Team 1 was really down to, you know, not very many people left in the team, so a bunch of us volunteered from Team 12, UDT 12, to go to SEAL Team. Yeah. But that watch kept absolutely great time. I loved it. It stayed within the uh, parameters of all my operations. And I've been through a lot with that watch. You had to be careful while you're parachuting. You, you, we wear gloves and sometimes a glove doesn't cover the watch. And this one time I went out the door and my tutor got hung up on the left door jam. We're up about a gazillion miles, 12,000 12, feet. <laughs> okay. So I'm going down and I'm looking at my thing. I says, I thought I lost it. And when I got down to the ground, there it was. It was hanging by the second pin. Right. It was amazing. The safety. <laughs> you know, the Navy and all their ingenuity, you know, made, made me uh, keep my watch. On another jump, doing something called Halo, which is high altitude, low opening, military skydiving. Right. So I'm up at Fort Bragg. We're on oxygen. And they cracked the door open. And we're up at 26,000 feet. They cracked the door open and it started freezing and everybody's mask got fogged up. And I looked out the tailgate and I could see the sun. It's like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. 
I said, geez, how high are we? But everything you have on you will frost on you. For sure. Not the watch. Did okay? Did okay. <laughs> on one dive, we took the SCV down, corkscrewed down to 120 feet. And uh, we were just gonna go down and uh, touch the bottom and turn around and come back up. We were using this rebreather, we were checking right. it out. And it was so dark. The only thing you could see down there is barely you could see the gauges on your SCV. Right. And then you could see the watch. That's the only thing you can see. It's dark down just, there. It's pitch black. In uh, the middle of 1972, we were part of a, a secret operation called Operation Thunderhead. And it was to be in position to help American POWs escaping from what was called the Hanoi Hilton. And uh, the helicopter made its pass on what they thought was a submarine at about 11.30 at night. And the submarine supposedly turned on their infrared beacon towards sea. So the helicopter would see it coming in and then would drop in and we'd swim to the submarine, lock in, mm -hmm. and then, you know, get ready for the next night. So I thought the helicopter was too high. So it made a pass, came around, did another pass, and came back around and did a third pass. And we knew we had to get out. We had to get out to the submarine and planned that operation. So the first guy went out, was killed. The second guy hurt his back. I was the third guy. And everything on me, weapons and everything, was almost ripped off my body, watch included. And, and the fourth guy that went out knocked the wind out of him and, and crushed his sternum. So you, the, the helicopter is still far too high? Way too high. Yeah. And too fast, because it's coming in with a tailwind. That watch endured that. This watch. This one here. Endured that. And the only reason we stayed afloat, because under our camouflage, we were wearing our wetsuit tops. Okay. So we stayed afloat. So we so found the first see. guy. Right. And he was floating face down. I found the fourth guy. He was floating face down as well. It was dark. The waves were high. And you hurt your knee on that jump quite yes. badly, didn't you? Yes, I did. And then to my understanding, it was 36 years later that it was declassified. Yes. And you were given recognition for your work yeah. in bringing all your buddies home that day. Yeah. The, the team guys, especially the guys that served in SEAL Team, during that time, there was only two SEAL Teams, one on each coast. So camaraderie between these guys is extremely close. And the, the one material thing that connected them together was the watch. Everybody liked their watches. That's the thing that they all had and they all wear it, you know, together. It shows that teamwork. And then from there, we have another one, which is a 7016. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You got that one a little later. A teammate saw a piece of art I did and his wife wanted it so bad. I said, you know, the last painting I sold was up around Vincent Van Gogh's cost, you know. <laughs> he says, I bought my tutor. I said, so. <laughs> he would have been issued that watch in 1968. Okay. So I had an old stainless steel strap that I had made in Subic Bay back in 1966. So I put it on this watch. And that's the strap here? That's it, right there. Very distinctive look, really cool. Yeah. And I had it to where I think on the back I inscribed my initials inside the latch. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. That's great. And then with these, let's say you were to lose one in a mission or whatever, do they just give you another one or you have to buy a second one? How does that work? Well, this, this is how the Navy works. You get issued one, you take good care of it. If you lose it, they will give you another one, just like it. Okay. If you lose that one, you gotta buy that third one. Okay. At a cost of $64. Okay, I mean. Yeah, well that's what your jump pay was per month. Okay, fair enough. About that amount. <laughs> And then finally, we have a, a lovely 5513 of Rolex here. What's I got that story? later. Yeah, because uh, I bought a Tudor, a blue face Tudor, okay. 1974. That was on the ship I was on. What would a watch have cost like that in 1974? Do you remember? It was about 150. Fantastic. And it was in the ship store. And uh, the, sh the supply officer came up to me and he says, All right, Mokey, I see you eyeballing this watch. How much you want to give me for it? I says, About 75. He said, Sold. You had your number. So, yeah, I, I bought that watch. This is uh, 1974. 
And I used that on a daily basis until I ran across an old frogman that had a Rolex, okay. this Rolex, the 5513. And uh, he liked the blue face tutor. So we made a swap. That Rolex, I've had it at least 20 years. Right. It's run faithfully every time I use it. And anything that's on your radar these days? Anything you're appreciating? I have to tell you a quick story. Please. In the 70s, I had a friend and I, we went up to it's a river outside of Riverside. I'll think of it in a minute. And when they opened the lake, the river rushes down through and they have kayakers in that. And he said, we're going to go dive for gold. So we did. We did a little diving and went up there two or three times. And I got maybe 25 penny weight. I don't know how much that is, but it feels a little bottle about it. You know, a third of the way up. Okay. But my ambition was to get enough to pay for a plane ride to Geneva, go up to Rolex and said, make me a solid gold watch with this. With the gold yeah. you got from the river, for sure. Everything. Okay. And it was a diver in California that did that. So that's still in my back burner. 